Stemmer. He is a, a retired history teacher, both from Middle Jersey and Tom's River. He now lives, where do you live with Pete? New Gretna. New Gretna, okay. Yeah, he is an avid student of yeah, Ocean County history. He's involved with the Tucker Historical Society and some other things. He has always been a wealth of information, but he is he's one of those kind of guys that is very is pretty balanced, and he doesn't tend to go to one extreme or the other. He's had a presentation. Now, I've not heard this presentation, but I've heard about the presentation from people, and they said it was excellent. He's going to be talking to you, as you saw in your advertisement, about a business that went on in what we call Great Bay and North into Little Egg Harbor Bay, the fish business, fish factories. But within that, I asked him to also address the geography of the area, because this whole geography of the area is something that John and I have been wrestling with, trying to figure out for what, a year now, John, about who, who's on first and where was first base to begin with. And so I think Pete will bring us all up to speed geographically, and uh, <clears throat> I want you to welcome him and uh, make him feel at home. Thank you, Norm. Norm put some limits on me. He said I only have two and a half hours, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going I'm to have to rush it. They tell me it takes me 20 minutes to clear my throat, so... Uh, I'll try to get through it quickly. Don't worry about it. We've got three or four hours. That's okay. Being an ex-history teacher, I'm used to kids talking and that. So if you have to get up and wash your hands or something, it's not going to bother me. It's not going to insult me. If you have any questions, just yell them out. You don't have to. Just. You know, I'm going to go through quickly with some of the slides, and you might be too fast for something you're interested in. We'll stop. It. Okay. I want to talk about the Little Lake Harbor fish factories. Not fish factory, fish factories. There were more than one. When I was first asked to give this talk a few years ago, they said, do the Little Lake Harbor fish factory on Crab Island. I said, fine. I started to do research and found out there were five fish factories, not just one. And it was a, 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 a very big industry at the time. But to talk about the fish factories, you have to start off with whales. Now you're probably wondering, what does a whale have to do with the fish factory? I mean, we're in Jersey after all, aren't we? Well, whaling was one of the most important industries in 16th and, and, and 17th century America. Everybody lit their house with whale oil. There was no electricity. And it was a big industry for over 200 years. And we don't think of it, about it in Jersey. We think about New England for whaling. But there was whaling in New Jersey. And the Dutch were the first whalers in Jersey, around Delaware Bay in the 1630s. And then it spread to Cape May. Most people know that Cape May was a whaling town. So that was in the 1680s. And it spread up the coast by the early 1700s. It was by Little Lake Harbor in Great Bay. That's the area we're going to be talking about with the, with the fish factories. And over a period of time, when we got into the mid-1800s with the Industrial Revolution and the Civil War, the demand for oil skyrocketed because they used it for lubricants and other things in industry as well as for lighting houses. And as the demand went up, the supply went down. They had to go further for whaling. It was harder to, to get the product. And you know what happens when demand goes up and supply goes down, the cost goes up. skyrockets. And that's what was happening. Whale oil was beginning to be too expensive. And then enter the lowly Menhaden. Menhaden goes by many names. I think of when I was a little kid, my parents used to take me uh, crabbing. It's the Menhaden that we used for bait for crabs. And if you remember, if you've ever had crabbing, you cut them apart and your hands get all oily. I mean, they are an oily fish. Small, 
but a lot of oil. They're not good for eating, but because of their oil content, and the, there, there were millions of them, schools of millions back then, <clears throat> by 1870, Menhaden oil that was pressed was a bigger industry than whale oil. The earliest use of Menhaden was in farming. If, if you remember your history courses about the Pilgrims and that, Squantos, the Indian, showed them to put it, plant corn, but what do you put in with the corn? Fish. 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 Well, chances are that the fish that they put in with the corn was Menhaden. Not always, but probably. Farmers got the idea, we'll get the Menhaden, We'll cut it up, and they use it for fertilizer. And that was the main use for Menhaden, was fertilizer on farms in colonial America. We're going to find out later, when the fish factory started in the mid-1800s, we're going to see fertilizer is going to come back into the picture. So we're going to be talking about fertilizer as well as whale oil. Tradition says, and we all know what tradition is, we all have family traditions, don't we? Well, tradition says that there was an elderly lady, Mrs. Bartlett, up in Maine, and she was boiling fish for her chickens. And she noticed something floating to the top, an oil scum formed. And she, she <laughs> scraped it off, she brought it to Boston, and they said they'd give her $11 a barrel for it. She came home, and pretty soon her family was in the oil business. That's what tradition says. It's a connection to chickens and fish. The first fish factory, they believe, was in Rhode Island in, in 1811. It was called the Pitt Barker Fish Oil Company, and it started out with two iron pots. Mrs. Bartlett had one pot. <laughs> Pitt Bartlett had two. When they first fished for Menhaden, they did it along the shore. There was so much fish that they didn't have to go out long distances like they did for the whales. I live on the Bass River, and certain seasons, I see the fish, the Menhaden still coming into Bass River, and almost the whole river is silver. They do, they do tend to flock al along the coast. But eventually, they they needed more fish, so they had to go out into the deep water, and they had to develop a new type of net called the purse net. So it was called purse fishing. And if you, if you didn't have a bottom on the net, and you were in deep water, where would, what would the fish do? Swim out. <laughs> Swim out. So the nets would have weights on the bottom, and they would pull certain ropes, and it would close like a purse and then they could haul the fish in. And the holes were so big that one haul could equal the weight of one whale. <coughs> they would swim, the Menhaden would swim in schools of millions. Not like, not like today where they've been, over, they've been overfished. And what they did was they had two boats they called them purse boats because they pulled the purse net. And they would have put the net out, and they would go along, and they would trap the fish. And that's how they, they would catch the fish. It started out with sail, and eventually it went to steam engines. And with steam, they could go out further, faster, and the yields got bigger and bigger. Now this is for Norm. Norm said he wanted some geography. So a brief geography lesson. This is a, a Google map. Great Bay. Here's Long Beach Island. This would be the Atlantic Ocean. This is the Little Lake Harbor Bay. Put things in perspective, Chestnut Neck, which you're all familiar with is here. This is the Mullica River, Chestnut Neck. 
Here we have Mystic Islands today, the Lagoon community, and along Great Bay, there are two parts of landers, Osborne Island and Wills Island. But Osborne Island should ring a bell with some of you if you've read Franklin Kemp's book. The affair at Little Lake Harbor with Pulaski. It was the Osborne family and the Osborne farm that the British marched through to get to Pulaski's troops. The Pulaski Monument right now, if you've ever been there in, in uh, Little Lake, is right there. So the inlet today is here. So if you wanted to get from the Atlantic Ocean and you wanted to get in Little Lake Harbor Bay or Great Bay, today you would have to go through this inlet. You turn right to get to Little Lake Harbor Bay and you go sort of straight or turn left to get, get, get to Great Bay. The inlet, however, has changed over the years. We're talking, we go back to the American Revolution which would be this time, this says 1850, but this would be the same in the American Revolution. Here is the inlet, and on the map they call it the old inlet. Because in 1800, a major hurricane happened, major storm. And a new inlet broke through, it cut, cut the island here. So you had two inlets. But during the Revolution, you had one inlet. And that's going to be important later when, when we talk about the zebra and, and uh, the British coming in. You can see over the years the inlet has changed. Eventually the old inlet closed off and today it doesn't exist. There's just the new inlet. This is a aerial map today. This is the new inlet. Here's the new inlet. The old inlet would have been here. It's not there anymore. Here's an 1828 map that shows you. Here's the old inlet. Here's the new inlet. For many years there were two inlets until the old inlet eventually uh, closed over. Here we have an 1849 map Here's the old inlet. Here's the Tucker Island Lighthouse on Tucker's Island. Here's the new inlet. Now, during the Revolution, when the British came in, they came in this way, the old inlet. The new inlet did not exist. So when the ships came in, they had to turn sharply go through all these islands and all around here to get to Chestnut Neck. Not so easy a trip when you don't know the lay of the land and you didn't have local pilots to guide you. When you hear about the British scuttled their, their flagship, the Zebra, because after the Battle of Chestnut Neck, they decided to, the British decided they were abandoning New Jersey. So, when they left, the zebra ran aground on the bar, not the bar like here, on the sandbar. And the sandbar was at the inlet. That's where the zebra went down, by the old inlet. Today, if you were going there and somebody told you the zebra sunk by the inlet, you'd go to the new inlet, that wasn't where it was. It was here. Right across from the old inlet in this peninsula here, that was known as the Foxboroughs. That becomes important when you study the Revolutionary War battle or the affair at Little Lake Harbor. I, I, I'm really not going to get into that because I want to get back to the fish factories. But I want to point out that that was called the Foxboroughs. And it gets confusing because by Chestnut Neck, here's Chestnut Neck, there's another Foxboroughs. So when you read about the Foxboroughs, be careful which one you're reading about. It, make, it makes a difference and it can get confusing. 
which gets us to the fish factories finally. The first fish factory in Little Lake Harbor was built in 1868 by Cyrus Smith. I'm not going to read these things. I just put them up there to show you that, that I document the information that I got. I just don't go to a encyclopedia and read it. I try to go to a primary source, a newspaper article, or a government uh, report. But Cyrus Smith started a fish factory in what's called Wells Island. Here's Great Bay. Here's Osborne Island. Now, they're not islands like you think of an island. It's not like Gilligan's Island. Uh, Wells Island and Osborne Island were surrounded by marsh, and they were high points of land. They weren't islands like we think of islands. And that gets confusing for some people. But the first fish factory was here by Cyrus Smith. This Osborne Island, in the affair in Little Lake Harbor, the Revolutionary War battle, when the British came up, they came up this way. And they went to the Osborne Farm. The Osborne Farm was on Osborne Island. And they took captive a Thomas Osborne, which they forced to be a guide for them. You know the story, probably. I don't want to get into that. But that's Osborne Island right next to Wills Island. This is an 1876 map that shows Cyrus Smith's fish factory right here. This is a map today which shows where Wells Island was. Here's Mystic Islands. Osborne Island would be here. Here's the New Inlet. Now, Cyrus Smith was, in the 1870 census, he was in Little Lake Harbor. He built the fish factory in 1868. This was two years later, and it says in the census he was an oil manufacturer. That was the fish factory. His uh, servant here, or a boarder, worked in the factory. Oil manufacturer. Ten years later, he was still in business because he's, now he's a manufacturer of fertilizer. By the way, when you do the census, let me just go back here. He's listed as Silas Smith. The census taker may have had a hearing problem. It's Cyrus. So when you do research, you have to make allowances for that type of thing. But the point I'm making was he was in business for, for an extended period of time. And he finally retired, and he uh, went to Lower Bank to grow strawberries. But Francis French purchased the uh, fish factory from Cyrus Smith. The next two fish factories, here's the Fox Burrows that we talked about. This is the new inlet. The old inlet would have been here. There were two fish factories on the Fox Burrows. One owned by James Otis and one owned by Fowler and Foot. James Otis came from Connecticut. He was a farmer. His father had passed away by now. He lived with his mother and his uh, brothers and sisters. He was very young. In, in 1870, he was only 20 years old in Connecticut. He buys a piece of property from a friend in Connecticut that lived in Saybrook for $800, he buys a piece of property on the Foxboroughs. Now, how he got to the Foxboroughs from <coughs> Connecticut, you got me, but he did. This is a survey of the property. It was 10 acres. And notice it says here, and this, this is the original, uh, uh, the scan of the original survey. In, in, in 1871. Notice it does say Foxboroughs. So that documents that it's an early, it's an early name. And right away, within a year, he contracts with James Otis to build the fish factory. And we have this contract in the Tuckerton Historical Society. 
I'm not going to read the contract, but when you when you do go through when you read the contract, it gives you an idea of what the fish factory looks like. It cost $750. It was wood, yellow pine. It was 60 feet long, 25 feet wide, and 20 feet high. So by today's standards, it wasn't very big. And part of the contract was that it was Otis's responsibility to furnish the equipment. And he used what? Iron kettles. Just like Mrs. Bartlett and the chickens. They boiled the fish in iron kettles in a wooden building. Remember that. File that away. <laughs> So there are two fish factories on the Foxborough. Fowler and Foote had a, a, a large fish factory in Maine also. But if you notice there's a dock here, and then that dock serviced both of the both of the fish factories. Here's a map from 1874. It shows right here that's James Otis's fish factory. It says fish guano factory. We'll talk about guano a little a little later, but it's the fish factory. In 1874, the Mount Holly Herald lists three fish factories in Little Lake Harbor. We have Fowler and Foot on the Foxboroughs, we have James Otis on the Foxboroughs, and we still have Cyrus Smith. This is 1876 Atlas, and here it's hard for you to read there, but it says fish factories. There are two fish factories there. That documents that. Documents that. All of a sudden, a, little, a few years later, there's only two, Otis and Smith. Fowler and Foote, that was listed before, is not listed. So the question becomes, what happened to Fowler and Foote? The answer is that it's likely, although I couldn't document it, it's likely that Otis bought him out, and Otis owned the two fish factories on the, on the Foxborough. In 1880 census, here we have James Otis, manufacturer of fertilizers. The fish factory, we, we connect with oil, with, with uh, fish oil. But fertilizer was a byproduct of it. So sometimes in censuses and reports, it will say fish oil manufacturing, and other times it will say fertilizer manufacturing. It's the same factory. It just depends. They're, they're, they're talking about a different, uh, a different product. And here's his letterhead from 1891. And notice it says fish guano. And it, it, again, guano is the residue that's left over. After they press, they boil and they press the fish, the pieces of bone and meat, and that, that's fish guano. You heard of bat guano droppings? Well, fish guano, same, uh, the same idea. And it was what was left over after the oil was extracted. And it was used mostly for fertilizer. Now what amazed me is that there was a big demand for this guano for fertilizer and James Otis's two factories, remember he bought Fowler and, and, and Foote, in, in 1891 he produced 3,000 tons of fish guano which is six million pounds. That's a lot of fertilizer. This is a big industry. 
And remember, they're boiling this fish in pots. Now, he had more than two pots, obviously. But he had a 60-foot-long building that's 20 feet wide. Well, he had, he had two uh, by, by this time. But can you imagine producing 60, six, or 6 million pounds of dried fish, pieces of guano? This is not his factory. This is just a, a, a fish factory in Connecticut. But I wanted to show you, here's a factory, and there's a plat wooden platform out here. They would spread the, the fish guts, or what was left over, on a wooden platform out in the sun, and they would let it dry. Can you imagine spreading six million <laughs> pounds of fish and drying it in the sun? For fertilizer. For fertilizer. Oh, yes. The, the odor, later on when Crab Island was there, they called it the stink house. Because when they were in operation, they were way out in Great Bay, but you could smell it in New Gretna and Tuckerton and West Creek, and you could smell it, you could smell it uh, all, all around. Here we have the Foxboroughs here. The next fish factory was on Story Island. This is Little Lake Harbor Bay. When you come through the inlet and you turn right and go to Little Lake Harbor Bay, there's Story Island. I don't know when it was built and I don't know who built it. Go ahead, just do the go back just one more. I just want to, okay. Just want to see the man. So I can interrupt you. That's all right. Sure you can. This is Big Sheepshead Creek, so I call them the Sheepshead Creek Fish Factories. The two down here, the Fowler and Foot and, and the Otis, but now we're talking about Story Island. This is an 1874 map, and it, it has the fish factories here, Fowler and Foot and Otis, or Otis after he bought Fowler and Foot out. There's nothing on Story Island. What I'm trying to do is narrow down when the story out of the fish factory was there. I know it wasn't there in 1874. I don't see it in 1895. This is an 1895 map. Here's Stories Island. Eventually, it's going to end up here unless the, the map maker didn't put it on. It didn't exist in 1895, so it had to be after 1895. But it is mentioned in, in 1914. So some 1895 to 1914, somewhere that's a big range, that's when it, that's when it was built. One of these days I'll get to Mount Holly and the deeds and maybe I'll be able to track it down. But in the in the twenties, in June 1920, it was run by the fish products company because this little clipping from the beacon says that they owned the factory on on Story Island. There was a stack, that's the fish factory on Story Island, there was a tall brick stack. And for years in Tuckerton and Little Lake Harbor, the clammers, the fishermen, they used that stack as a reference point to navigate and to plot out their, their, their clam lots. So it, we know that the stack was still there in 1821. It's amazing sometimes where you have to go to find information. Here's an obituary that I found in the paper that says it's Joseph Ryan, who was a laborer on Story Island, the fish factory. He died. He came from New York. He didn't have a family. He was buried in Tuckerman. But that tells me that Albert Summers Company owned that fish factory in 1822. The, the uh, Summers had, they were from down further down south, but many of these people who own fish factories own more than one, a chain of them. 1824, I found evidence of a sheriff's sale, so by this time, it was in bad shape, wasn't making any money, and getting ready to close. Norm, yes. was that related to our Summers? No, not probably not. No, it would have been from down, down, <coughs> state, down south. state, yeah, I mean, south, 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 yeah. No, 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 I'm sorry, not south. Uh, Jersey. 
And the Tucker and Beacon reported in 1938 that the old fish factory, by those words tell me it wasn't in operation. They're calling it the old fish factory. It burned down in 1938. This is a picture of what it looks like today. I took it, well, 40 years ago. This is all that's left. That's the dock and some brick piles. This is Story Island. The last two fish factories are on what's called the Seven Islands. They also called them the Seven Sisters. And here's the Foxboroughs again. Here's Story Island, Great Bay, Little Lake Harbor Bay, the New Inlet. These seven islands here were called the Seven Sisters. That's what we're, we want to zero in on. In 1886, there was a newspaper article that said there were four fish factories in the area. Here we have Otis we talked about, Francis French um, on Wills Island, and there's two more that are listed, Wharton's and Suey and Cavalier. Now, one of those names ought to ring a bell with you. Probably not Suey and Cavalier. <laughs> Wharton would ring a bell with you. Here we have a, a, a close-up. This is Crab Island. It's the largest of the seven islands. That's where, where Wharton ended up. Is that where the ruins are today? The yes. Factory? Yes. And this is called Little Crab Island. That's where the Suey Cavalier the place was. This is an aerial map to give you an idea. There's Little Crab Island, there's Crab Island, and here's the ruins. Mm -hmm. this, this is the satellite picture from, uh, from, from today. So I want to start with Suey and Cavalier. They were, they were there uh, <clears throat> at the smaller Crab Island, but they were producing in 1885 180,000 gallons of fish oil. That's a lot of fish oil. Wharton, who we'll talk about in a few minutes, he was producing double that. He was producing 360,000 gallons of fish oil. Imagine how much guano. <laughs> the Suey and Cavalier facility was rented out to a lot of different local people from New Gretna, from Tucker, and that over the years. So from 1880s, late 1880s to 1890s, it was rented and owned by different people. This is a little Crab Island today. This is all that's left that would show you something was there. It's the remnants of a dock. And if you blinked, you would miss it. There's nothing on land that would indicate that there ever was anything there. A friend of mine, a, a clamor, Jimmy McCanny, he tonged up where those old docks were. He tonged up these bricks. They were the remnants from the fish factory, but they were underwater. There's nothing on the island to indicate that there was a fish factory there. Here I'm standing on Little Crab Island. I took a picture looking across, and that's the ruins of the, fish, the bigger fish factory on, on uh, Crab Island, which we're going to get to now. Here we have Big Crab Island. Mm -hmm. And we get to Joseph Wharton. <coughs> now, Joseph Wharton bought the Seven Islands in 18, uh, or Francis French had them in 1870, rather. Joseph Wharton bought them in the early 1880s. He bought all of the islands. This is an old, this is an old survey. Now you're probably wondering why would he buy them? He bought them because he was going to build a fish factory. And why would he want to build a fish factory? Well, first of all, he wants to make money. Wharton was a wheeler dealer, philanthropist, uh, in, in a lot of different uh, businesses, but he owned 
Fasco. He bought over 10,000 acres. I forget the exact acreage in, in, around Fasco that eventually became the Wharton State Forest. And he had this scheme that he was going to pump up the water from the Pine Barrens and he was going to pipe it to Philadelphia and he was going to make money. Sounded good because the water at this time in Philadelphia was terrible. A lot of diseases and everything and it, 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 it really would have worked. But the New Jersey State Legislature, they did do some good things. They said, uh-uh. They passed the law in 1884 to make it illegal to export water out of New Jersey. So all of a sudden, Wharton, his plans to make all this money from selling water down the tubes. So he turns to the fish factory. He had thought, because in Batsco, he had a lot of farming. And he was going to use the guano from the fish factory for the farm. He was going to sell the fish oil and sell the guano. And it was like a companion industry to bat stuff. Wharton didn't do things in a small scale. When he did things, he did it in, in, in a big way. By 1906, he owned 41 steamships. 41 steamships that was, were going all up and down the whole coast, not just in New Jersey. So he started to amass an empire uh, of Manhattan factories and fleets. And over a period of time on, on this crab, on Big Crab Island, remember these are all wooden buildings? and fire. There was a series of fire, and I'm not going to get into a lot of details, I just want to, to bring home the fact that every couple of years everything burned down. Here's 1906. Here's another fire in 1907. Robert Sauters, the little clipping in Mount Holly Herald, Robert Sauters is watchman at Crab Island where the fire that destroyed the factory is still burning. I put this picture in because Robert Souders lived in uh, New Gretna. He was a, was a New Gretna boy. But every couple of years, they were rebuilding. It was part of uh, the business plan, I guess. And so Wharton decides he's going to collect fish factories. Okay, why not? He buys the, now by this time it's Adams Cavalier, but the, the one that we talked about in Little Crab Island here. He buys that fish factory. He buys the fish factory on Wills Island. And he builds the fish factory on Crab Island. So he owns three fish factories in, a, in, in the same proximity there. Are there any other people against him now? He, does he have a... He's, he's got a monopoly. He's by, by, this, by this time, he's got a... Yeah. yeah, by this time... He, he, he just buys out all his, his competitors, and he has a, a, a monopoly. And here's a little uh, from an American Fertilizer magazine. Here's some of his factories, uh, Cape Fear, Chesapeake Bay, Luz, uh, Long Island, Maine. He's up and down the coast. He's buying everything. In 1909, he dies. You can't take it with you either. <laughs> so he passes away in, in 1909. So in the, the Wharton uh, fish business is it, in Jersey at least in, at an end, and eventually in, in, all, in all the other states. And two brothers, the McKeever brothers, from Brooklyn, New York, here, here they are, they buy Crab Island. And they run Crab Island from 1910 to 1926, 16 years. <coughs> they had to start from scratch to build the facility again because it had just burned down right before they bought it. 
Now the Menhaden season runs from April through November. So in the off season, the McKeever brothers decide they want to move their boats inland to protect them from hurricanes and, and winter, bad winter weather. And they dock their boats. This is the Bass River. This is the map today. This is the Bass River Bridge. This is the Bass River. This is the Bass River Marina. Viking Yacht. This is Allen's Dock. That's a little local marina. The McKeever brothers buy this property. Allen's Dock wasn't there at the time. It was just open property. And they dock their boats along here by the Bass River in the winter. So if you went over through Bass River, when the McKeever brothers owned it, here's a picture of their Menhaden boats docked at Bass River. There were some pretty big steam, there were steamboats here at, 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 the, at this time. Now, a good friend of mine who since has passed away, I was um, fortunate to uh, inherit her photos. And up in her attic, there were pictures of the Crab Island Fish Factory when the McKeever brothers owned it. This was her relative, Ben Loveland. That was her uncle. And he was a superintendent at the Crab Island Fish Factory. And I'm just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in these pictures, but these were taken around 1910. And you can see these are schooner masts here. It still was sail at that time. This is a big spool that they would drive the nets on. And these were the buildings that were were at the fish factory in 1910. Before this, I had never seen pictures of this old. Here, here you see a, a, a steamboat too. So it was a mixture. By 1910, you had steam and you and you had sail. I love this picture. Here we have the big spool. This is where they would drive the nets on these big spools. This was a bunkhouse. Because the crews for these ships had to live someplace. They lived on Crab Island. You know that, um, was it John Henry, the song, I Owe My Soul to the Company Store? Well, it was the same, I think, with the fish factories. They, had, they, they bumped there, they bought everything there, and they were almost prisoners for the, for the Menhaden season. And what I love, and I, I don't know if there are any environmentalists here tonight, this is an outhouse that's sticking out over the dock. <laughs> so they weren't eating a bag. They contributed to the fertilizer, making oil and fertilizer. But that, that's a great photo. That's funny. Here we see a, a, a steam boat, and here we see the, the the schooners again. And these boats were coming in and out all the time, constantly. During during uh, during the season, and they were cooking fish constantly, drying guano constantly. Now I mentioned the McKeever brothers. I thought well maybe some of you were baseball fans, uh -huh. but there's a connection between the McKeever brothers and Ebbets Field and a fish factory. It seems that Stephen and Edward McKeever, they were builders in Brooklyn, and they were business partners and associates with Charles Ebbets, who owned the Dodgers. You heard of Ebbets Field? Well, Ebbets wanted to build Ebbets Field, and he didn't have the money. The McKeever brothers had the money. So Ebbets sells half of the Dodgers to the McKeever brothers so he could build Ebbets Field. And here it says that they purchased stock, and the article uh, talks about that. The baseball field and the outfield was fertilized with guano from Crab Island. So that's the Ebbets Field connection to, to, to Crab Island. And this is a little newspaper article talked about a rescue of a ship. 
But what it said is, <coughs> captain of the fishing steamer, owned by the McKeever Brothers, incorporated, fertilizer manufacturers, and their office was at Ebbets Field. So they ran the fish factory from Ebbets Field. Here we have the McKeever Brothers with, with Ebbets. Here's uh, Ed McKeever and his wife with Ebbets. <laughs> so that's the Ebbets Field connection. Now, during World War I, Crab Island shut down. They stopped operation. The Menhaden steamers, the government was resourceful. You know, we didn't have a navy, not too much of a navy. So the Menhaden steamers were used, were appropriated for the war effort. I'm sure the McKeever brothers got money for them, of course. But here's uh, McKeever brothers' Menhaden ship that was converted to a minesweeper in World War I. So the, the fish factory shuts down. Many of the boats are used in the war effort. And then after the war, in an effort to make more money, they started taking garbage from Atlantic City to Crab Island and incinerate it, make a little extra cash. Now, we talked about stink. So now you had a Menhaden and you had garbage. On the return trip, they brought a problem. Back. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> Pro uh, probably. Well, the garbage operation went bankrupt in, in, in 34, and Crab Island sat, sat idle until the late 30s when J. Howard Smith came along, <laughs> and he had a big Menhaden business along the Atlantic coast, and he buys Crab Island in the operation and uh, eventually turns it over to, to, uh, to his son, who runs the business. So it becomes a Smith company. And this is a little clipping from the peak, and it just showed you some Smith boats. And we're down to 1939 now, and the harvest and everything is still good. They're still making money. Big demand. And you see a lot of, uh, this is from the, in the Tucker and Historical Society, the literature has the Smiths, and they, they had various names. They kept changing the name of the business. I don't know why. There probably was a tax reason for it or something like that, or a business reason for it. But the Smith brothers uh, did own it. They incorporated, they put an airfield in. Uh, I was talking to Norm the other day, and he said he saw a picture of it the remains of the airfield. And a Piper Cub would go up, and they would fly looking for the schools of Menhaden. And they would look for oil slicks. They were still doing that in the 50s. I grew up with that. Yes. yes, they were. They were fishermen. Yeah. And they, they had planes. Yeah, and the fish were so oily, they would produce oil slicks. Mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how they would find the schools of the fish. And the production really increased when, when they did have the planes because they, they could get there fast with, with this, by this time it's all steam or diesel later. Um, uh, and they modernized the fleet with diesel vessels. And this is with the Smiths. Here's the Sil Silver Star, one of their boats. Here's the Crow's Nest. They would get up there and look for oil slicks. There's a couple more boats, the Barnegat and West Beaver. Notice the crow's nests again. Now notice the buildings are getting bigger. Now these buildings here, this is when they were in good shape. You see skeletons of them now. Here you see the dock where they're unloading the fish. These were the cookers. We're, we don't have uh, Mrs. Bartlett. 
in her pot, stirring up her pot. They had cookers that they would cook them in, and then they would be transported with, with, uh, through pipes, and they would put them in centrifuges, and they would spin. And the oil would spin out, and it would leave the, the, the fish parts, which they would dry in ovens for the guano. So now things are being industrialized that were done by hand years ago. The Menhaden industry peaked in the mid-50s. You had, you had mentioned the, uh, the 50s. 1.6 billion pounds were caught in 56. That's a lot of fish. It was a, going into lava, there was a Menhaden back there on the right-hand side. You know, there were, there were a few up and down the coast of Jersey, yeah. By the mid-60s, though, things sort of bottomed, uh, bottomed out. They were overfishing. You know, man doesn't um, know how to conserve resources, it, 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 it seems. And it seems like we never learn that when you have a good thing and you can make a buck, you keep making the buck and making the buck and making the buck by, by, by using up your resources, and then pretty soon you've got no resources left. And without uh, some type of government help or intervention, or uh, in the case of the Menhaden, right now, the catch is limited. They have, they have rules and regulations now. But by 1965, they stopped fishing here in Jersey, and they brought up from Louisiana, they brought the fish from Louisiana, and they processed them. No fishing in Jersey in, in the mid-60s. By 67, they were down to 10 employees. So they were about, they were done. When I, I graduated from high school in 64, and I remember my last couple years going up from Ventnor in, in our boat and going up there and trying to explore and a couple getting a couple pieces of rock salt in my butt yeah, for exploring where we weren't supposed to. Yeah, they had just a, a crew of 10 people to protect the, the, the buildings. That's about and, and what to it keep was, people yeah. And to keep people off. Is that why I don't see you sitting too often? That's exactly <laughs> right. Yes. The rock salt is still embedded. In it. By 69, it had stopped. They had a crew now of eight. And uh, the last boat to leave was in 74. And in 74, they permanently closed the plant down, officially. And the seven islands that we talked about, the Seven Sisters, uh, which included Crab Island, was sold to the state of New Jersey in 1974 as part of the, uh, and it eventually became part of the Edward B. Forsyth National Wildlife Reserve. And in 78, the legislature allocated money to tear down the factory, to, de you know, decommission it, uh, you, you, you could say. But they, they, they appropriated the money, but they never did it. You know how the state works, they want to do something and they use the money for something else? Well, they didn't use, they should have torn it down, and they didn't. And in, in 82, a fire went through and destroyed most of, the, most of the buildings. And today we just have the ruins of, of a skeleton of what was a major industry that employed a lot of people. In, in all the surrounding towns, and it was a big part of the, the economy. This is a, a satellite view uh, today of what's left. What was the landing strip? Do you remember? Is that it, right to the left of the tower? It looks like something artificially straight. Uh, not. I think it was more up here. I'm not okay. exactly sure. It's been a, a few years since I've been there. Uh, here's a photo I took. Well, it's. Last time I was there in 2010, when I when I took this picture, I think the landing strip was back off, off of there. Yeah. And that's all that's left of it today. And that's it. Thank you.
So I don't know if you have any 